Because before we had multiple bricks, uh, I mentioned that the web is made out of rectangles, uh, rectangular boxes. Uh, these boxes uh, have a model. Let me make a slight peek. All the boxes on the internet follow this called a box model. So before we go into this a bit more, I want to introduce you all to something called DevTools. Uh, this is a very useful thing when you are doing web development. So every browser, you are using Chrome, you are using uh, uh, Firefox, you are using Edge, you are using Safari, all have this thing called DevTools. So what it can do is that the website you see, you can see all the code that, is, uh, that, that, that makes up the website. So if you are on Windows, you can use Control shift i or Command shift i on Mac. If that doesn't work, try to do it from the menu bar. But the most, co wait first, the most common way we do it is directly on the website, right? We right click and then we find the word inspect or inspect element or something to that. And then you click on it, it should pop up something like this. So my slides are actually a website anyway. On Firefox, it's inspect element. So what's going to happen is it's going to have this thing that pops up. And then you will be able to see your HTML and your CSS. Uh, Chrome might look a bit different, but we have similar things. Uh, let's see how it looks like on Chrome. Chrome inspect, or oh, Chrome just uses the word inspect, which is fine. But also, again, you will be able to see your HTML and then your CSS. And what is good about having DevTools open while you are doing uh, your, your web development is that you can try and error on the browser itself. So, for example, I, uh, like right now there's this, I highlight this, the, my P element. So what you can do, right, you try doing, you just hover over you'll notice that the browser does this, like it, it show, highlights your element for you. So you can see the different elements. Refresh. And when you select it, right, there's a blank, there's a blank thing here, element style. When you click on it, right, you can type into it one. So you can sort of test out things. You can change the color from here. You know, you can change font size from here. Okay. Very small, very small. So, sort of like a testing thing. You can do your CSS here. And you can type. But whatever you type here is not in your code. So the moment you refresh the page, it's gone. So for now, you can do it to, to test things, to, to debug things. Um, so this is a, a very helpful tool that usually we keep it open like all the time. For example, if I want to look at this, then I'm like, oh, uh, what happens when I add things to this? Ay, why doesn't it work? Don't like Chrome. Let me go back to Firefox. <laughs> so for Firefox, same thing. You can align, you can toggle styles on and off with a checkbox also. If that's something that you want to do, that's DevTools. So that's a helpful intermission, but let's go back to the main thing that I was trying to say. So if you're using Chrome, right? 
Chrome actually, I stole this image from Chrome, lah, let's to be honest. So if you're using Chrome, you should be able to see it here. So what happens is that when you highlight, you'll notice that there's some orange. Because browsers by themselves, they, they have default styles. So if, you, if the browser didn't have default styles, right, everything would just be text in a one size in the same uh, format. So browsers are come, come with a set of default styles, but these styles can be overridden by CSS, which is what we do. So browser styles specificity very, 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 very low. Like they are like almost out of the, because the moment you style something, a uh, user style something, it overrides the default styles. But you can keep the original default styles also. So that's, that's just one thing. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that there's something called a box model. So your content, right, only takes up the blue box. You can, the space that your element takes up, right, also includes something called padding, which is the next layer, border, which is the layer outside that, and then margin, which is another layer. It's, it's like, uh, I don't know, layer cake or something. So that's how you can figure out how much space your element can take up. So you sometimes it feels that margin and padding, like it's the same thing. It feels the same until you, you sort of visualize it. Margin controls space between elements. So how to show this is that I draw a dotted line around each element. Uh, it's, it's very blur, but I'm hoping the color you can see from the back. Like each element, I have, I have drawn dotted, different colored dotted lines, right? The margin will control the space between the elements. So if I had taken away my dotted lines, it actually would look the same if I did padding or margin. But if you use padding, the effect might be the same, but the calculation of the amount of space that your content takes up is different. Because the padding controls the size of the box without adjusting the size of content, meaning there is no space between the elements. It just increases the size of the content box. This doesn't seem to make a difference here, but it will when you do things like apply background color or background image. Because the background applied on an element, the amount of space will be the amount of space of the, the content. So, for example, if we go back to the code and go back here, uh, Background color purple is applied to the space which my H1 takes up, the amount of space it takes up. Right now, if I go to H1, you will notice that there's this yellow highlight. If you're using Chrome, I think your highlight will be orange. This is the default margin that browsers give me. By default, the browsers put in the extra space between my, my header and my uh, P. So if for the sake of the example, right, like I'm just going to do it directly here. I remove all the margins. Ah. So the space is, the space, there's no more margin when I highlight. If I increase the padding around, the purple covers, the purple includes the padding. If I change this back to margin, the purple does not cover the margin area. That is the difference when you are using margin and padding, something to keep in mind. Uh, so if you don't really do anything about the background, maybe, the, maybe you can get away with it. But quite often, your elements may have a background, or elements may have an image. Uh, then this is something that you need to keep in mind when you're like, eh, the effect is not what I really want. So this is something to, to keep in mind. But let's talk about something fun. 
Borders are quite fun. You can do a lot of funny things with borders. And let me clean this up first. So far, the CSS properties that we covered are single property, single value, right? But CSS properties, some of them can have multiple values, and border is one of them. So again, I'm going to go back to here, MDN, which is my favorite encyclopedia, and I'm going to search for border. Because border can take in multiple values. Because you can control different aspects of your, uh, your border. So, if you have multiple values in your CSS property, you would um, divide, you sort of split them using spaces. So for border, right, usually we use three values. You can use one or two, but three values, you can control more things. So the first value in a three value, if you're using all three values, first one for the width, how thick your border will be. Second one for style. Because you can have a number of styles, you can have dash, you can have solid, you can have dotted. The last one is the color. Because by default, uh, by default the color will be black. But sometimes like nah, black border will be boring. So why I say borders are fun? Because there's a third, there's a there's a fourth value. Actually there are many values for this. I just realized that there's double. So uh, is there a full list? Ah okay, okay, here's a full list. So for, for the how the style uh, style, you can all these funny things. But today let's let's try something called inset. So, okay, the most basic, most commonly used border is solid. Because um, it's a very standard vanilla use case, solid border. And uh, you, can all, you can also try out the different values. You can try out dotted. Just like effect, right? But... Um, Personally, I like in inset because it is like free photo frame effect. Because inset means, can you imagine that the it, the border is like you want to create a fake shadow effect inwards? Inset. Oh sure, sorry. Let me put it back. And the interesting thing about borders is that for a number of CSS properties that uh, concern the concern a box, so the border, the margin, and the padding, right? You can apply it evenly to all four sides, but for all uh, for other purposes like margins, paddings, you can actually target single site. So if you don't specify a, a, a site, default, everybody gets it evenly. So my border is 20 all sites. But I can also do something like border left, then only, only on the left. So depending on the effect that you want. For margin, also the same thing. Padding, also the same thing. If you only use without a, uh, without a direction, you'll apply evenly throughout. But if you specify, you can just focus on one side. Uh, yes? Here for the, on the MDN guide, right, the mm. syntax, does it matter, why does it matter like the order of the... The order matters uh, because the compute, like, all this code, right, we are typing it in human language. Human language. But compute, like, your, your machines do not understand human language. There's one more level that happens on the browser level whereby it will, it will read all this 
English, these, these human readable terms convert to uh, code that machines can understand. And the order is, so it, it's actually based on pattern matching. Like it can tell that border left, this is a pattern. And it will expect that the first value is width, the second value is style, the third value is color. If you mix it around, the, the, the algorithm doesn't understand that you mixed it around. It, it's expecting a width, you give it a color, it's like, no, it will just <coughs> ignore it. Your, so your style, if you use three values and you mix up, you can try, I don't, it won't work. Your, your style will not be applied, it will just ignore. That's why for multi-value CSS properties, and again, I hate doing this to you all, but for some, the order matters, like border. For some, the order does not. So again, that's why it helps to have the MDN open. It will tell you whether the order is important or not. So for now, just remember that border, the order matters. Sorry, is it open? MDN open? Sorry. Huh, oh, I say keep it open as a reference. Keep it open, as in? Uh, tap, uh, tap. Oh. Uh, you don't want to keep open, so can. It's just helpful. Yeah. It's like you have an open book exam, then the book next to you. Okay. Yeah. So this is border. So the question now is, how can I get my image, which is display block, or any other element that is display block, but does not take up the width of the container. How do I align this? How can I get it to align to the middle? Because I, I want this in the middle. So we can make use of the margin property because what does margin? Margin controls the space between elements. Space on all sides, all four sides. So margins like borders, like width, like height, they can take values. So numerical values are fine. I can do something like margin uh, margin left with 50 pixels and then it will just move. Ah, wait, what's happening? Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong element. Uh, margin left. I cannot spell. Yes, it will push. But if I want it like in smack in the middle every time, right? Other than numerical values, margin takes this magical property. I call it magical because it's a property that, that is very hard to explain, even for people who have done this for a very long time. But there's a value you can use called auto. What auto actually does is that it will detect the amount of space available and then... So how, how, how this is calculated? Com uh, browsers interpret all this is step by step. Uh, like I mentioned to someone earlier, you will read and then you will interpret. So what it does is you will read, you will calculate, then you interpret. So for margin, right, you will, you will first have to know like, okay, the element takes up so much space. So if you are the browser, you know how big you are. Yes. I know how wide I am. Okay, that's my starting point. Then I know how wide this element is. Okay. So because I know how wide the element is, I also know how much space is left, right? So when I set margin, when I see the, the, the instruction margin left auto, I, I will take whatever available space. So myself, how wide I am, okay, element this much, I have this much space, I will allocate the margin left property that much space. That's what auto does. So if I do margin left auto, you kick it all the way to the side because again I like okay I know how wide I am. I know how wide the image is. This is the amount of space remaining. Margin auto will assign uh you you won't you won't have you don't have to calculate the, the, the value yourself. Browser calculate. Browser says okay, this is the amount of speak size. Auto will be converted to a number, but you don't need to know this number. Because the browser internally knows the number. Browser internally calculates and sets it for you. Auto, you will use all the space. So in order, we leverage this property. So we call it a trick. Lah, because it's kind of weird that we do it this way. But if you want this to line up 
right smack in the middle. We add another auto on the right. So what happens is that you're like, okay, left also auto, right also auto. That means I should give both sides the same amount of space. So just kick it to the center. Left and right equal amount of space. And then your whatever it is will be aligned to the center. And this is a very, very common technique we almost always use to try to align block elements uh, cent centralized. There are other ways to do it now. But for the longest time, this was the, the way to do it. Because today, I only introduced two display properties, but there are more. There are more. The thing about CSS is that CSS was invented in 1994. Back in 1994, there wasn't so many CSS properties. CSS is a language that gets new features quite frequently. So recent years, there have been new display values that, that, that have different properties. So, but in order not to confuse everybody, let's stick to two, because with these two, we can already do a lot of things today. So this is one of the methods you can use to sort of do uh, alignment. So I think for today, right, this is sufficient. You've learned enough to be able to do something to create a, uh, a basic website. You can sort of align things based on this. So I want to cover very briefly two more things that I mentioned we will cover earlier today is that the command line and git. And this may or may not make sense to you. So I'm going to try my best to explain it as well. So let's talk about computers. So I'm, I think everybody, when you all first came, spent about like 25 minutes trying to set up to install things like Windows people had to do a different set of instructions, Mac people had to do a different set of instructions, Office computer had to do a different set of instructions. Because computers run on operating systems and there are a lot of different operating systems. Your phone, phone is also a computer, also has its own operating system. So things like Windows, when I say Windows, when I say Mac, when I say Ubuntu or Linux, Android, iOS, all these are operating systems. And this, think of it as your computer's manager. It handles what your computer can do. It's like a PA for your computer, for your device, right? And how computers store information, all computers store information. All your computers have files. But how they are stored and organized, think of it, it's different. It's like a different model of file cabinet. So those of you using Windows, when you try to ex when you look at the look at your URL for the index.html file that you've been using all day today, you'll see like C drive, right? C drive, D drive, drive letters are something that Windows systems have. If you're using Mac or Linux, right, you don't have drive letters. You also have folders, yes, but no drive letters. But that's because Different operating systems use different models of file cabinet. That's the reason. So every computer has a command line interface, but it may look different from computer to computer. What we've been using, what I've been using, and most of your, almost everyone is using today is a graphical user interface, GUI, where I can use mouse and a, a cursor, I point, I click and things, I double click things. These are ways that I give my computer instructions through graphics, right? Another way you can give your computer instructions is through the command line. So this is like a command line interface. This is just one way it looks. Usually it involves a dark screen. Uh, I think the default for Mac is a white screen, but there will be a blinky cursor. So I mean, Windows people, you have this thing called command. Probably it's very blur, I'm sorry. Uh, like mine on Mac looks, basically it's just text on a background, different color. But it's, think of it, it's just a different way of telling, giving your computer instructions, right? And for today, for, for HTML and CSS and JavaScript, for web development, actually for most programming today, Graphical user interface is enough, but when we need to run things uh, on, on computers that are far away, 
cause I had I had actually I skip a section today in terms of like how computers work. I let's see if I can cover this in like five minutes. How the web works. Clients and servers, right? What we have today in front of us, these are all called clients. Clients. Because when you go to www.facebook.com, right, the page, the images, the text, the data shows up on your browser. But you all know, today when you're doing your work, right, everything is on your own computer. When you load Facebook, you know the files are not on your computer. Why? Your browser can load those files. But these files exist somewhere. They exist on Facebook's computers. Clients and servers are just computers. It's just we assign them different names because of their function is a bit different. Clients, think of it, servers, service, provide something to the client. You, your, your machine, receives this service. If this black line is the internet, servers, directly connected to the internet. So servers are, again, computers. So Facebook has servers. These files, Facebook also will have HTML, will have CSS, will have JavaScript, will have all these files live on physical servers. This idea of a cloud is just jargon. It's not up there, it's down here. Servers. And then, of course, we have internet service providers, which are for, in our case, Starhub, uh, Singtel, internet telcos. Uh. They're also connected to the internet, and they provide internet to us. Uh. Then there's us. We connect to, I'm not sure who ThoughtWorks uses, but let's say, for example, they use something like oh, MyRepublic, internet service provider, MyRepublic. They provide us uh, internet. We connect to the internet this way. At every connection point, there are things called routers. So there will be a router here in this building where we are connected to this TW guest. There's a router where we are connected to My Republic. There's also another router. When My Republic connects to the internet at large, another router. The routers are what sends the information to the correct place, because every device in the world has a unique IP address. IP address is like a house address, and so when we say www. Facebook. Com, but you can also have things like dot sg la dot co.uk, .ly. These are domains, top-level domains, which essentially what it does is addresses, right, are numbers. Every, because computers do numbers, generally do numbers very well. IP addresses are numbers, but these are very hard for people to remember. So there is a mapping. There's like a phone book, phone directory that tells me that uh, 10.3.8.65 is the www.facebook.com. There is such a directory. Um, it's called DNS, but I'm not going to go into that. Just think of it as there's a phone book, there's a directory, keeps track of all this. And that's how the whole concept of unique resource name. That's why you, you cannot have the same file name for different files on your computer. It's so as to ensure that Every like address, every file is a unique address. It's just think of the internet as large, like Earth, Earth, then then country, right? Then Singapore. So then it's like maybe your country's uh, data center. Then a bit smaller, your your maybe this this area is serviced by a certain provider, and then smaller and smaller. So the address is every single every billion. All the billions of files in the world, right, are all unique, all can be accessed if you are connected to the internet. You'll never overlap. So how it works is that when you type a URL, you're sending a request, and the server will respond to this request. So how it works is that you will type a URL. You will type www.unicorn.com slash rainbow.html. And so the first part I tried to explain earlier is the protocol, which is the standard set of how devices talk to each other. Second one is the server. So the computer where which this file lives. So unicorn.com is a computer that has all the files for unicorn.com. Rainbow.html specific. I want that file. I want that HTML file, please. When you click, when you press enter, sends to the server. Unicorn.com, that's the server. It's like, hi, do you have rainbow.html? 
If there is, he has, he'll say, yes, I have it, I found it. And then he'll give it back to you. And when he give it back to you, your browser is like, oh, OK, I received the file. I will read it, and I will show you what is inside uh, rainbow.html. Request and response, request and respond. So you request from the server, and the server serves you, the client. So your phone, your computer, all these, these are clients. But everybody is a computer. Everybody is a computer. So everything on the internet connected by links. So when you click on a link, right, it's just a URL, but you didn't have to type it. It's pre-typed for you. So same process, if I encounter a link on my web page, it's called, oh, I want to see my beautiful gallery of rainbows. I click the link. I send a request. I'm like, hey, can you also pass me gallery.html? Like, yes, I have it. Give it back to you. Your brother, OK, I'm now, at, I'm now showing you not, not rainbow, but gallery.html. That is a very high level explanation of how the web works. So that's, this is the part that we covered. So when we go back to the command line, right? A lot of times, we do not host the files on our own computer. If you ever create your own website, right? If you think about it, you will shut down your computer from time to time. Sometimes while traveling, I shut down, not connected to the internet. So if you think about it, you can host your own website on your own computer, but not that feasible. You, ideally, you would want to sort of rent space for your website to live in, like at a very stable, like it's always there. So there are services that provide this, right? But these are computers that are not yours. They are somewhere else in the world. So when we access these computers, there is no screen. We cannot see. There's no, there's no graphical user interface to communicate with those servers. That's why you need to know about this command line interface. Because it's the most, un and up till today, uh, from the 60s until today, the way to communicate with a remote server, we use the word remote server because it's not, it's, it's remote, it's far away. It's through the command line. No way about it, around it. So this is why um, you, we will be covering this, I think, in uh, probably workshop two or three. But today serves as an introduction to, to what this is. So command line interface. Um, one of you would have been, oh, okay, no. I did not cover it at all. So how it works is that you will have to give it commands. So most of you today, you all did something called uh, like the Windows people had used like uh, Choco uh, install or something. The, the Mac people were like brew install something. These are commands. So you're just giving, think of it as I'm just giving my computer instructions, except that instead of clicking, I'm typing. Unfortunately, Different programs have different set of instructions, so then it won't be the same set of instructions. Every time you install a new program, new instructions to use. So that is the command line. Um, if you had uh, signed up for a code anywhere account, you will also be able to talk to, because code anywhere is an online service. So all the files that run code anywhere and your files code anywhere all online so if you want to access the files you will have to type so i think today we don't have a we don't have a chance to to do it but you can sort of i'm just going to show an example on my own my own computer because what's happening with my own slides right is that I'm, I'm serving it off my local, ah, this is not good. So these are my, these are my slides. This is what's happening uh, on my slides. So I'm using a command called grunt, which you, I will have because I installed a program called grunt. And then when I, when I run it, it runs my slides. So, so, so that's, that's basically what the command line is. It's not something that is magic. It's not something that's very foreign. It's just another way for you to give your computer instructions. And uh, as you go on, you will end up using this, uh, especially if you create your own website and then you want to host it somewhere. And then you want to access files, you want to upload files. Uh, yes, there are, there are graphic user interface methods for that. But this is faster. This is very fast because it's only text. They don't have to send you images over. 
So this will be good to just don't not not don't be scared of it and something that uh, you should try to pick up uh, if this is something that's interesting to you want pursue it further. Uh, we it'll be good to learn about the command line because it's a file manager also and my font color is terrible. Let me change the color so. Uh, oh, there's nothing that's a dec oh, no, there's nothing that's a decent color. I'm sorry, <sighs> but uh, it's as if I'm using File Explorer. It's just that this I can use an ls. I'm typing ls to just list all my directories. So if I open the File Manage Finder, right? This like is the equivalent of this. So I have the same stuff. I have applications, applications, desktop, desktop. It's the same. I'm you doing the same thing except using uh I'm typing. LS just lists all the folders. If you're using Windows, you will not use LS, you will use DIR. Eh hey, no. Do you use DIR? Show show directories. <laughs> DIR, I think. Is it? <laughs> DIR, I believe DIR you will also use it. You can use it to list uh, directories. If you DIR slash P, if it's very long, it will pause. Um, you can use CD to move among directories. So for example, on Finder, I want to click documents. I double click, then I can see. I will see on the command line, I will CD documents. And then you'll see that I am actually accessing the folder documents. And then if I LS for Windows users, please use DIR. I will be inside my documents folder. So that this is a, again, I'm just giving my computer instructions. Uh, list. Yeah. Excel, yeah, change directory. So again, very English, very Anglo-centric way of commanding your computer because unfortunately, com computers were, were developed in English-speaking countries. Uh, I think by now you all realize that I am very happy that England did not get into the World Cup final. Never mind, moving on. Um, so that's, that's for command line. That's fine. Another thing I want to mention, and again, this is uh, in preparation for the next boot camps to come, if you all decide to come back, something called version control. Yeah, this slide, yeah. got some error here, but sometimes we cannot find the slides that, you know, your error, error sometimes cannot find the slides. Uh, yes, because I uh, skip slides here and there sections based on this. Um, but the full set of slides, uh, I guess you all can slowly go and thumb through the whole thing. Today I'm just using this to help me do some explanation. Uh, so version... Will always be there or will be there? Yes, it's online. The link is... I will flash the link again later. Okay. Uh, so... This version control is basically controlling versions of your files. I think everybody has encountered version control. Almost everybody should have en encountered version control. It happens when you create a document. Let's call it uh, document version 1. And then you send it to your manager to review. Then your manager looks at it, does make some edits. Then he calls it document version 2. And then your manager sends it to his colleague to, hey, can you take a look at this? Uh, okay, can colleague make some edits, calls it document version 3, and then the colleague sends it back to you, and you're like, oh, 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 okay, it's quite different. I suddenly thought of new things, I'm going to add again. Then you say, oh, okay, but, but I'm enhancing on top of version 3, so maybe I call it document version 3.1. Uh, okay, then you send it back to your manager, then the manager looks and like, mm, okay, this is not bad, Let's, uh, I think we can publish it soon. So it becomes document version 3.1 underscore final, and then, but just before you publish, you read it through, oh, something wrong. So it becomes document version 3.1 3 underscore final underscore edited. 
and you end up with a folder of like 20 documents. Same document, just slightly different. But because you don't want to lose the previous version, you just rename and save, rename and save. Because this is what I used to do when I was not in tech. I was working at a bank and I, had, I always had version under final, underscore final, underscore last final. Uh, so that is one way you can do version control. Version control just means that you want to monitor every time you make a change. It's fine. Another way we can do version control is through something called Git. Some, some of you pronounced it Git, but I think generally we, we agreed that it's Git. Uh, uh, I, 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 I thought Git was something that you score people with British people, but I don't know. But Git is a con version control system. So there are certain terminologies that you will hear in the future workshops. You'll hear the word repository. If all of you had a GitHub account, you would have also seen this word repository. And you would have access to repositories today. The first one would be uh, the one with all the instructions on how you set up your chocolatey or your um, brew. That was one repository. Then there was uh, the second repository containing the web dev intro files. That's another repository. But it's just a place that stores all the project files. So we were, that those were two separate projects. You will hear the word commit. So commit is a command. It is used to take a snapshot of the state of your project. I explained to someone earlier. So with Git, right, you still have a lot of different versions. As you save your files, you make changes. Like from earlier this afternoon, the base HTML until what you all have today right now, you made a lot of changes, a lot of changes. But with this commit, this concept of commit, it's every time you make a commit, it takes a snapshot of how your file looks like, stores it. So because we didn't do any commits throughout the day, if you committed right now, then you only have the one o'clock, uh, the one thirty version and the uh, 5.14 version. But if we had done something called commit throughout the day, we had committed like once every 15 minutes or once every three commands, we would have had many, many commits, many, many snapshots. But what happens when you look in your file, in your, uh, in your own directory, you only see one version? Because all these snapshots are stored in a hidden folder, in a .git folder, I not if you have, I think most people don't because by default, your operating systems have these things called hidden files and by default they don't show. I had to toggle some settings to show. For mm, Linux or Mac systems, the convention is a dot in front of the folder makes it hidden. And I think most of you probably won't have toggled this. But your computer has a lot of hidden folders. Git is one of those hidden folders. Unfortunately, I cannot make my finder any bigger. So uh, trust my description of this. Uh. There is an additional .git folder. The only person who will be able to see this today is the lady using the code anywhere. Because code anywhere shows the .git folder in the sidebar. But I think some of you may if you downloaded the zip, don't have. But if you had, you have clone another phrase I'm using, clone explain later. If you clone a repository, you always come with a .git folder, and there is where all the snapshots are, are, are stored. But for you, for a normal user, right, you will only always see the latest version. You will not see 20 index.html files. So there's another concept called a branch. Um, so what, is, what happens is that for a repository, you can have multiple people working on the same repository, or you yourself, you have, you're testing out new ideas, and you know that you, the code you write is going to be quite different for each. What you can do is you can branch. So think of it as uh, you're, you're along a road, and then you suddenly decide that I'm like, I want to make a left turn. You, are bran you branch off to the left. So now you have two paths. So what you can do is you can switch between these two paths. And you can make changes in two separate paths. 
So there'll be two sets of snapshots being, being stored every time you commit in your respective branch. And you can switch between these branches. So you are switching your snapshots, so to speak. Um, this, is a, this is a very straightforward way of doing it, but Git has a way of making sure you don't accidentally overwrite and more complicated things like that. So let's, we won't talk about that yet. Another term you'll hear is fork. Fork like spoon and fork, fork. A fork is just a, a, a phrase that we use to describe copying a repository. So like I mentioned branch, right? Branch is like I choose, this is my repository, then I choose to split into two different versions, can have more, la, no, no limit on number of branches. But sometimes, like you see like your friend's repository and then it's like, oh, it looks quite interesting, I can build on top of it. You are not going to write code onto your friend's repository, you're going to do it on your own. But you want to copy everything that they had as your starting point. So when you fork your friend's repository, it makes an exact copy, but it's your repository. So whatever you write, whatever changes you make will not go back to her anymore. It becomes yours. But it's that initial copy, it's called a fork. That first time that you copy that repository. So these are commands that you use to do uh, the, this process of version control. And Git itself, right, is actually a program. It's a, that's why some of you, when you started, uh, if you didn't restart your terminal or you didn't restart your command prompt, when you try to type the git dash dash version, keep telling got error, got error. That's because your command line didn't know that you already installed git yet. So if you did not install a program, you cannot use its commands, right? So once you restart, then it like refresh and oh, uh, I have git installed now. Then when you type git dash dash version, like, oh, okay, that's a command that I understand that I'll show you. Oh, you, are, you have now installed git version 2.18 or something. So git is a command that only uh, works if you have in git installed on your computer, which all of you have had. That's great. So what you can do is, just now I showed you how to move between folders, move between folders. The general uh, instructions for, for doing a, a version control with git you make sure you are in the project directory. So for, for us, the example is the web dev intro folder. So uh, from the command line, I will cd, cd, cd into that folder. And then while, when I'm in this project folder, right, and it's a git repository. So before, for all of you who downloaded the zip, it's not a git repository because you just saved some files. You, to make it into a git repository, you have to type something called git init. Um, a, you could try to do this or you can just take it as uh, instruction. I will just type it out here so you all can see the word. Init. Init stands for initialize. That is how you generate this .git folder. It will be empty at first first time, git init. After you have this, your project is considered a git repository. Before, it's not. It's just a normal folder. Once you run git init inside the folder, it becomes a git repository. So with that, you can start using all these git terms. Uh, some of you, maybe when you go back and try, you try running any git command in a project that is not that you never git init before ever you will see an error. I think your command line will tell you that this, uh, this is not a git repository or something along that line. It will tell you, hey, this is not, I cannot run git commands on a, on, a, on a folder that's not a git repository. So I can do that. So there's a, there's a phrase I use, it's called stage. Again, it's a lot of jargon, which I don't really like, but unfortunately it's standard phrase. Stage the files. So before you send all these files into the GitHub is a place that hosts all your, can, can host your uh, repositories. So it can, it can live only on your computer, yes, but you can also send it online to GitHub to store so that uh, other people can access your, your projects, right? So before you send the files up, right, or before you send the files 
into this storage, this git storage, you have to stage it. So you will git add a specific file. I can, I can target, I, I only want to uh, sort of snapshot my index.html or I only want to snapshot my styles.css. Can you could do that? Most commonly, we would want to stage all the changes. So the dot is short form for everything, everything in the folder. Git add dot is everything. So it was staged. So it puts all your files in this temporary area. Because before you send the files up, you need to label it. Because as like I said, every time you commit is a snapshot. So how do you identify all these different snapshots? You can write a commit message, which is essentially a label to label each snapshot. So here it says write a sensible commit message. Uh, let me explain. It is possible to write anything here. You can write a commit message called ghost send. Nothing against that. You can write a commit message called bug fix send. But these are not descriptive. It's very similar to why I what I explained about alt text. It has to be descriptive to be helpful. I know that this is a commit. So if you write commit and you say that's not helpful at all. I don't know what's happening inside this particular snapshot. So a sensible commit message will be something like, oh, add styling to guess the number app. So what it means is that, oh, this particular snapshot, the changes I made from the previous thing is that I added styling to my app. Or it could be things like, if you want to say you fixed the bug, right? Can you can say fixed uh, fixed bug on header positioning issue, so that it's a way for you to uh, know what exactly it is you saved. Because what 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 is good about Git is it allows you to time travel, it allows you to roll back. So if you commit regularly, like twenty commits in, you realize that oh, something is broken. I broke something in between. So if you label all this correctly, right, you you will know like you can it's sort of a reminder like what I did, like twen for twenty commits, like at each step, what did you do? Each like checkpoints. It makes it easier to if you suddenly remember that, oh I accidentally deleted one line of uh, one line that I I didn't want, right? You can actually go back and reference, or you're like, oh, from from uh Let's say I have 20 snapshots, right? From 16 onwards, actually, I think I was going in the wrong direction. I don't want everything from 16 onwards. You can say, okay, I want to revert back to snapshot 16 and start from there. Can You can roll back. So it's very important to have sensible commit messages. Otherwise, if everything is just called commit, 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 good luck, good luck getting back to the commit message. That, good luck getting back to the snapshot that you're looking for. That's why you have to stage the files first. You stage already, then you label. Stage and label, and after that, you finally, okay, have, after I've labeled it, send it up. Send it up, git push. Git push is I push these changes up to GitHub or wherever uh, my, my, my project repository is. So, so this behind up. one change, one commit, then one push. You can, so, when to commit, right, it's really up to you. Some, the, we, we like to commit regularly, it's just to make sure that if somewhere in the middle we broke something, right, we can sort of slowly, slowly roll back without losing too many things. If you one shot do a big commit, a bit commit, harder. Push. Then if you ah. make another change, commit, then push a bit. Some, yeah, the general procedure is like that. Um, so... So yeah, first step is git add. Git add is it will put all your all, what, whatever you've changed. Uh, you will, you will, like just imagine that okay. it, it goes somewhere, but when it's that somewhere before that you cannot push it because you haven't labeled it. So labeling by git commit, then you label, then you send it up, like you push it up. That's the general process of how git will work. Today no not don't don't cover because it's uh, a bit more complicated, but the I think the, either the next workshop or the third one, you will have to do this as part of the uh, uh, assignments that you're doing. So it is now uh, 5.30, so ideally we, I'm going to stop here, so if you all have any questions or anything, you all can ask or, or, or whatever. Yeah, so um, before anything goes, I just want to say that
today is a Saturday. Uh, you could be anywhere else in Singapore today enjoying your life, but you chose to spend your time here with us and we are very appreciative that you showed up. So thank you all for coming. And yeah, if you have any questions, we're all around to, to help. Yeah, so thank you very much. So I'm going to flash all these links.